The year is 1348. One of the most extraordinary, and for historians like me, one of the most fascinating episodes of world history is starting to unfold. Word is spreading across medieval Europe that people are dying of a strange pestilence. Having reached the banks of England, it's headed for London, and there's nothing that London's teeming population can do to stop it. Strange black lumps appear on the victim's necks and groins, called buboes. The reason it's called the bubonic plague. Within 10 days of developing the symptoms, over half of those infected die an agonizing death. But the bubonic plague is not a disease consigned to history. As John Tull discovers when he develops strange symptoms while on vacation in New York. We took a cab to the travel doctor's office. I was so sick by that point that I could not sit in a chair in his waiting room. And I laid down on the floor. And he took one look and said, you have the bubonic plague. With his condition rapidly deteriorating, John and his wife, Lucinda, are rushed into hospital. By this time, I was totally out of it. And uh, they suggested that uh, they put me in a medically induced coma. Lucinda and I talked about it a little bit. We thought it might be one or two, three days. Well, it turned out to be 90 days. Within two days of his going into this coma, his extremities started turning black, his hands and his feet. Today, in the West, the chances of catching the so-called Black Death are slim. But in the 14th century, conditions are primed for the plague to spread like wildfire. The world population had dramatically expanded over the previous centuries. London had gone from a population of 15,000 in the 12th century to 80,000 in the 1300s, all hemmed in between the river and the old Roman wars. London was more densely populated than it had ever been. Perfect conditions for an epidemic to flourish. The squalor is extraordinary. With no sewage system, human and animal waste runs down the streets like a river. Yet despite the filth, medieval London's a thriving center of international commerce, as it is today. This might look quintessentially modern, but trading has been going on in London since medieval times. The city was packed with people. It was a commercial hub. Driven by the demands for silks and spices, international trade flourished. London was overrun with exotic imports and people from around the world. And as well as goods and people, London was being filled with something it didn't want that had been brought to England's shores. The international trade opens the door to a new foreign visitor, Asian black rats who thrive in London's dirty streets. And on the back of these rats are fleas. We now know carry the plague bacteria, Yersinia pestis, in their stomachs. But in the 14th century, with no understanding of how the Black Death is spread, the people are defenseless to its invisible threat. And so when the disease did arrive, it ripped through this densely packed population and did immense damage. Although uncommon, Rats carrying plague-infected fleas are still found in some parts of the US. We live on five acres, and it's in the country. And uh, we have thousands, probably, of rodents just on our five acres. And maybe a third of them have the plague. All it takes is one bite from an infected flea. And John's immune system can do little to stop the plague bacteria from spreading. While John is still in his coma, Lucinda is forced to make a life or death decision. Lucinda woke me up on January 14th or 15th, 
And she said, uh, honey, I love you. Uh, it's January 15th, and your legs have been amputated. If I had not given permission for that, I don't think John would have lived. And I was de determined that I would do everything within my power to see that he would live. So painful, painful, difficult, horrible as it was, I made that decision and gave them permission to do amputations. Although science has done much to combat the plague, as John Tull shows, it can still strike with horrendous effect. In 14th century Europe, all they can do is bury their dead. Excavated plague pits in London give a terrifying indication of just how fast the disease kills when it enters a city's walls. So, Yelena, this is actually the skeleton of a 14th century plague victim. It is, yes. This is a female, and she was found from East Smithfield Catastrophe Cemetery. I'm guessing that she was one of many. Yes, um, from that site, we, we curate over 600, but they believe that there were several thousand uh, that would have actually been buried there. So, yes, high numbers of people dying very quickly. In England, over a quarter of the entire population succumbs to the Black Death. When this huge number of people died, how did they cope with all the corpses? You might think with a catastrophe that you're just going to get these great big open pits and everyone's just going to be flung in rather randomly. But the interesting thing about East Smithfield is that people are actually being placed in a very nice, neat, ordered manner. They're trying to sort of follow the process of a Christian burial, so they're sort of trying to keep some sort of degree of normality around, you know, this sort of awful epicenter of, of this catastrophe. By the time the Black Death finally retreats, it's killed one in three of Europe's population, equivalent to over 240 million today. The death toll, the cost, and the legacy of this disaster have no equal. The Black Death was the most profound disaster that humankind has ever known. Its symptoms were horrifying and degrading. It brought fear and humiliation. It was sudden and lethal. It was the ultimate pandemic and the worst natural disaster that humankind has ever experienced. It's little wonder that we remember it with horror 700 years later.